Lunar, so not we should know for binds men um day or Edward Snowden. Um and we'll do this in English for a while because we might have somebody listening in. Um how did you two guys connect? <laughs> I guess I can start off by saying hi to Ed. I know he's listening, and to the uh, NSA and other agencies. Um, Hello, Hello. 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 So, uh, Thank you. So Ed and I first met uh, about six months before the leaks came out. Uh, where we organized a crypto party in Hawaii, which is basically an event where people can come and learn about um, encryption, about security, about um, how to protect themselves online. It's uh, it was really sort of an amazing experience uh, when we look at it in hindsight, because you know this was before anybody knew who I was. Uh, Runa was associated with the Tor project, which is uh, basically they they work to help protect people's anonymity online. Uh, I, at the time, was working for the NSA uh, through a contractor and uh, sort of moonlighting, also helping people protect their privacy, which the NSA might not have been too happy about. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the extraordinary thing about this is, uh, that we can draw as a lesson from it, is the fact that these kind of uh, systems, these, these word of mouth uh, efforts to teach people how to improve their security actually work. Because the same kind of methods that I used to teach people, uh, ordinary citizens how to use to protect themselves online, also protected me against one of the largest manhunts in recent history. Um, Edward Snowden, uh, this is Ulle Torp in Oslo. I, I uh, would just very much like to welcome you to this media conference. There's about 600 people here from the media business in Norway and in Scandinavia. Um, waiting for you to uh, to uh, have your conversation with uh, Runa, um, and the the conference will of course appreciate your urge not to talk to journalists today. So we'll hand you over to her very very uh, soon. Um, uh, although it's it's <laughs> it's hard for me not to ask all of those <laughs> tricky questions that I would like to have asked you, but. Um, but you're very much welcome here, uh, albeit in, uh, in, on a data line. So next time in Bergen, we'll hope to see you uh, live. And uh, right now, I'll hand you over to uh, Runa, one of the few people that you trust, obviously. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you. So yeah, I, I wanted to start off by, by asking you about something that happened yesterday. We got some, some pretty exciting news, and um, I also want to add some context um, for the audience. So the first document that was published by The Guardian in uh, June, almost two years ago, revealed that the NSA was collecting phone records of millions of Verizon customers daily. Uh, so it showed that the US government was collecting phone metadata on, on thousands of people. Um, and so shortly after um, this document was published, the ACLU filed a lawsuit. And yesterday, uh, we heard that the Second Circuit Court of Appeals held that the statute the government is relying on to, to justify this program, um, Section 215 of the Patriot Act, does not permit the gathering of this information and that the surveillance program is unlawful. Um, and so what was your reaction when you first heard about this? Uh, this is significant. Uh, the importance of it in the United States legal community, the policy community, really can't be overstated. Um, when, we, when we look at the actual, uh, the actual uh, ruling and, and what it held uh, was that the, the program that had originally started as warrantless wiretapping under uh, President George Bush in the 9-11 era uh, and then was eventually they, the Congress tried to pass sort of authorizing legislation, a fig leaf that would let it go by, um, had, uh, had basically never been lawful to begin with, and yet they did it anyway. What's extraordinary about this is the fact that in 2013, uh, prior to the leaks, the same issues had been, uh, 
they had been tried to be, uh, to be reviewed by the courts. Uh, another NGO called Amnesty International brought the same challenge against the same individual, the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, and they threw it out of court because they said that Amnesty International could not prove that they had been spied on. Because of this, whether or not the programs were lawful, whether or not they were a violation of rights, they would not allow them into the courtroom. Uh, come 2015, uh, when basically the first uh, story that had been published by uh, Glenn Greenwald and the other journalists working on this uh, was uh, a secret order from a secret court uh, that basically said, you can monitor the phone calls, uh, intercept the call detail records, uh, collect all of the metadata, metadata being analogous to the kind of information that private eye would collect if they were following you around. Uh, not necessarily a record of every single word that you said in conversation with someone else, because you might notice them, but they would know where you had traveled, who you had met with, uh, where the meeting took place, what time it occurred, how long it went on for, so on and so forth. That is a sort of metadata in the phone context. It's not what you say on the call. It's who you're calling, how long, uh, association records, basically who your friends are. But this secret program authorized that to occur in secret, uh, sort of um, by a secret court. Uh, and it wasn't something where it authorized uh, any particular targeting of any particular individuals. Rather, it said they could collect the full records of all 330 million Americans in the country uh, without having any criminal suspicion, without having any reasonable suspicion, even of wrongdoing uh, of any kind. Rather, they would collect it all in advance of any criminal investigation or criminal activity. And this being struck down uh, is really a radical sea change in the level of resistance that the United States government has faced thus far. So far, courts have said basically, uh, it's not our place, our role, to tell the executive branch of government how to do their job. It is extraordinarily encouraging to see the courts are beginning to change their thinking to go look. If Congress will not uh, pass reasonable laws, if the executive will not uh, act as sort of a responsible steward of liberty and rights uh, in how they execute the laws, it falls to the courts to say, look, this has gone too far. Uh, this no fair reading of the law uh, would authorize this. And even had that occurred, it's not reasonable to expect the public to have known uh, that this was the law and it must change. And that's, that's really significant. And I think it's, this decision will not affect only the phone metadata program. It will affect every other mass surveillance program in the United States going forward. Great, thank you. So we have read a lot about fi the Five Eyes, which is the um, intelligence alliance that includes Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the UK, in the US. And we've also heard that um, the GCHQ and the NSA are working a lot, I guess it's, it's, it's safe to say. And even that in some cases, the GCHQ can do things that the NSA cannot, and that NSA analysts are then allowed to sift through the data that um, the GCHQ has gathered. And so one thing that we haven't heard a lot about is what is the relationship between the NSA and Scandinavian, or more specifically, Norwegian intelligence agencies? So I can't actually speak, uh, I, I can't reveal new information. I leave that to the journalists. I, I made a specific decision in how I went about uh, revealing information about sort of these criminal activities and, and serious wrongdoing within the government uh, by recognizing that I have very strong political biases uh, and if I simply revealed this unilaterally, uh, it may not be the best way to serve the public interest and mitigate any uh, potential harms uh, that could come about from this if I didn't understand something or if uh, you know, there was some detail in there that could put someone at risk. So what I did was I worked in partnership with journalists uh, who received the journalistic material. Uh, as a condition of receiving the material, they agreed prior to publication uh, to actually run these stories by the government not for the government to censor them, uh, but for the government to be able to look at these and go, look, this isn't going to get anybody killed. Uh, this isn't going to put a human agent behind enemy lines at risk or something like that. Uh, you know, this isn't going to make Al-Qaeda be able to bomb buildings. And I think the, the value of this model has been proved to be uh, quite effective 
Because despite the fact that in 2013, the government was saying, you know, this was going to be the end of society, uh, the atmosphere was going to uh, ignite and the seas were going to boil off, it was going to be Armageddon. Uh, here we are sitting in 2015, and despite the director of the National Security Agency, Central Intelligence Agency, FBI, so on and so forth, being asked to show damage as a result of these uh, public revelations, they had never been able to show even a single case where it's caused harm to any particular individual program. Uh, so with that caveat put out there, what I will say is the culture of modern intelligence, mass surveillance, uh, and how these agencies sort of interact with each other. Um, the head of the Norwegian Military Intelligence Service, I think, has already admitted that uh, he shares information that's collected by Norwegian services and things like that with the NSA. Uh, they trade that back and forth with other countries. Um, and this is very much the same that you see in the United States and other countries. Within the Five Eyes, uh, it's much more liberal, much less controlled, because basically they simply uh, put everything they collect from all their countries in a common bucket, and they sort through it and do whatever they want with it. Um, for other countries, it's a little bit more like trading cards. I uh, analogize it uh, to a, a European bazaar. Uh, the Germans say, take what they've collected in Germany, uh, that could be other European regions, and then they trade that with other countries. Uh, same thing in the Netherlands, same thing in, Nether uh, uh, in uh, Norway or, or Sweden, so on and so forth. But they all would argue that they're in full compliance with their laws. Uh, they would say, you know, we do things in accordance with our policies, we've got restrictions, uh, we can't target our citizens, and so on and so forth. But they're selling out every other citizen in the EU. They're selling out other countries uh, in the EU, uh, private companies, uh, basic services, public services that everybody uses, uh, as well as undermining the, simply, uh, the simple security uh, that protects communications as they transit through Europe and so on and so forth. The problem is well, every individual country is doing these same things. Uh, you end up with situations where the Danes say we're not spying on the Danes and the Germans say we're not spying on the Germans. But when Danish communications enter German borders, they're spied upon and shared. And when German communications enter Danish borders, they're spied upon and shared. So the net result is that we all end up less safe, we all end up uh, more exposed. And when we look at the fundamentals of mass surveillance, even if we agree that this was good policy, uh, which is very much in contention, that's never been shown to be uh, helpful, uh, we would go, is the cost of liberty of these programs worth the benefit, uh, any sort of hypothetical benefit that we would gain from it. Now in the United States, because of the scale of the scandal, um, the aggressiveness of the press and sort of chasing it, the President of the United States was forced to appoint two uh, independent panels from the White House. Uh, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board and another one called the President's Review Group on Information and Communications Technology. They both had comprehensive access to classified information. There was nothing the intelligence agencies could hold back from them. They could interview uh, everyone from the highest level to the lowest level in them. And they looked at these mass surveillance programs. And they said, let's talk about efficiency. Let's talk about metrics. Uh, has, for example, the 215 program, Section 215 of the Patriot Act, uh, that was struck down as unlawful yesterday, but has still been continued. Uh, did that actually help stop an attack? And this panel, which had every incentive uh, to basically let the government off the hook and say, this is great, uh, this is really helpful, because it was appointed uh, and comprised of friends of the president uh, and other members of sort of the White House policy community, uh, former deputy director of the uh, CIA, I believe, was among them. Uh, and what they said, in fact, was that not only had these programs never stopped a single terrorist attack, despite operating for around 10 years, they had never made a concrete difference in even a single terrorism investigation. And so there's, there's really a lot of evidence that mass surveillance has no public safety benefit, but it does have a significant cost in liberty. And once we're looking at this reality, we need to be asking questions in somewhat of a different frame. Uh, and journalists need to realize for themselves that despite claims of terrorism, terrorism, when these laws are being authorized, these programs are not about terrorism. These are not pro, uh, public safety programs. These are spying programs. Their value is in intelligence gathering, not in anti-terrorism. So a lot of the articles that we've read and a lot of the documents are specifically about the US um, and US citizens. How does this affect 
um, people outside the U.S.? How does this affect Norwegian citizens? So this is, uh, this is quite difficult for anyone who's outside of the United States, who's not a U.S. citizen. As you sort of mentioned, uh, this is the PRISM program. This was one of the first ones that was uh, revealed. Uh, all of the corporate uh, identifiers that you see in these slides, the logos, are partners with the U.S. National Security Agency, whether that's the FBI, uh, whether that's the NSA. They all trade information on the basis of some kind of compulsion. If you are a U.S. citizen, uh, they can't get this information uh, theoretically through the companies without providing a warrant. Now, the sad thing is that warrant goes through the secret court, uh, and that secret court is kind of a rubber stamp. They're not reliable. In 35 years, they've only said no 12 times. But if you are not a U.S. citizen, no warrant is required. The Attorney General of the United States uh, signs a blanket warrant uh, for entire classes of behavior. Uh, and if you are a foreign national and they consider you of interest because you match one of these classes of behavior, they can demand your private details from any of these companies and you have no legal recourse. You are not uh, alerted that it happened. Um, you don't have any access to the courts. Uh, and if it is eventually used against you at trial, uh, at least uh, traditionally, this is beginning to change now, uh, you would not even be told that this secret evidence was used in the development of your case. So you have previously said that um, an NSA analyst, if given someone's email address, can look up that person's email. Um, is that the case even for Norwegian citizens? Can an NSA analyst, for example, look up the email of the Prime Minister of Norway? Right. This, so this comes down to the technical structuring of how these programs of mass surveillance work. I worked with them personally, uh, so I, I know this is factual, uh, and it's actually never been contested uh, in any sworn testimony. Um, what we're talking about here is a system called X key score. X key score is uh, basically you can think of it as a Google search for spies. Uh, all of the different intercept points around the world, all of the buckets that are being filled by mass surveillance in all of these different countries, the United States, uh, the UK, New Zealand, and so on and so forth. If your private communications as a Norwegian citizen pass through any of these countries, pass through any of these sensors, they fall in the bucket. Uh, I, as an analyst sitting at my desk, can search those buckets for anyone, technically. Uh, you know, people will say there are policy restrictions, there are uh, auditing and whatnot, but those really aren't reliable, and we know that uh, because the NSA now, some years after the 2013 revelations have occurred, say they have no idea what I had access to, uh, what information was given to journalists, despite the fact that it's now in the newspapers. So the real danger here is not whistleblowers. It's not the idea that someone uh, could take sort of classified information uh, of, that indicates criminality, serious wrongdoing, and provide it to the press. Uh, that's not a threat to democracy. In fact, there are, are strong arguments that that's actually uh, a strong defense of good government. But what happens when there are uh, individuals at these agencies, whether it's authorized, and this is an official operation happening as a, within the course of their work, or they're doing this privately for their own agenda, their own intentions, uh, you know, for political purposes, uh, or so on and so forth, begin searching for anyone. Um, the, the bottom line here is anything that crosses the internet that's not protected by encryption, uh, reliable, robust encryption that will defend against attacks by the most sophisticated adversaries, state-level actors, uh, groups like the National Security Agency or the UK's GCHQ, they fall in these buckets. You know, when the Prime Minister of Norway sends an email over the internet and it's not sent to, you know, another secure system uh, within the government, uh, or, you know, it's a CEO of a European company, or it's a civil rights activist uh, in Norway who's trying to protest drone strikes in the Middle East or trying to campaign against torture. That's in these systems, and that's, you know, one, one search away from any analyst's fingertips. And there are really no good, uh, reliable protections against abuse here. We know this is the case because we see this being discussed in Germany right now. Uh, the Germans had set up a system, basically, uh, that allowed uh, analysts at the National Security Agency, the British Security Agency, and so on and so forth, uh, 
to send searches against their systems as well. And these, uh, the idea here was that these searches would be screened by machine filters and so on and so forth to drop out uh, any search that might be at contrary to the rules. But the problem is no human was looking at these searches in advance of what was happening and actually laying eyes on it and going, this is a legitimate target, this is a legitimate surveillance request, this is in compliance with the court order, or this is someone going on a fishing expedition, or this is contrary to our domestic laws. That kind of auditing would only happen on the back end after searches would occur and so on and so forth. Uh, and it would happen on a random and partial basis. It wouldn't be comprehensive. And in fact, in the German inquiry, uh, just a few days ago, I believe, uh, it may have even been yesterday, uh, the people in charge of this in, in the uh, German BND, uh, the local domestic intelligence collection agency, uh, they said that the records of what had been searched by the NSA had been accidentally deleted as soon as Parliament began asking for it. This is not a problem, you know, this is not a criticism of Germany specifically. This is not a question, uh, criticism of the U.S. specifically. Uh, this is not about anti-Americanism. This is a global problem. Uh, this is happening in countries, not just in, you know, uh, advanced economies, uh, liberal economies, uh, or liberal societies. This is happening in authoritarian countries, deeply illiberal states. And the worse our policies are here, the fewer protections that we afford citizens, uh, the more we embolden uh, very dangerous actors in very uh, dangerous regions to do things that are even worse. We have a moral obligation uh, and natural incentives for the protection of our own liberties to set a standard here that really pushes us forward and improves the protections of rights, not something that undermines them and provides all of these different methods of backdoor access, not just to intelligence agencies, uh, but to any sort of abuse. Once you begin cataloging and collecting the private records, into, uh, you know, uh, data generated by people's private lives, where they go, who they talk to, what their cell phone's doing, their call records, their internet transactions, this data becomes a target. Uh, and we've seen this from, from hacks, uh, cybersecurity incidents over the last several years. If you create a database that is basically a collection of all of the most uh, deeply personal, uh, valuable to adversaries, and incriminating details about everyone's private lives, they will be abused, they will be attacked, and they will fall outside of our control. We should not be creating weapons that can be used against us. So we talked a bit about uh, digital security tools earlier, and as I wanted to come back to this um, in my final question, what can concerned citizens do, what can journalists do to actually protect themselves online? Uh, so there is a, a crypto party movement that is basically, uh, you should be quite familiar with, um, that we, uh, people who are, have some understanding of the real technical capabilities here and the countermeasures uh, work within their communities to increase the sophistication of journalists, uh, of, of ordinary citizens, everybody around them, um, to enable them to assert sort of defenses against these. The problem today of mass surveillance is that most of our communications transit the internet electronically naked. Uh, they're unencrypted. That means when your computer tries to have a transaction with whatever service provider on the internet is there, uh, any, you know, whether it's you're ordering something online, uh, whether you're sending an email, uh, whether you're communicating with your friend via your cell phone, uh, the telephone, the telecommunications service providers who are sitting in the middle uh, can be compelled by intelligence services, by law enforcement services. Uh, they can be compromised by criminal hackers and other adversaries uh, that allow them to intercept in bulk everything that's transiting those lines. Uh, when you use systems, uh, one, for example, is Tor, uh, an anonymizing routing network. It can be uh, called a mix net because it sort of protects everyone's communications by, by mixing them together and making it hard to see where they originated and where they ultimately, what their ultimate destination was. Uh, when you begin doing this or you use a virtual private network, a VPN provider or something like that, you armor your communications as they pass through those interception points as they pass through those telecommunications providers. Uh, and you make it much more difficult to intercept not just your communications, uh, because you may not have uh, anything that would 
uh, in your private life that could put you in prison. Uh, you may not be a journalist working with sensitive sources, but when you adopt the same methods of communication that are used by journalists, that are used by activists in very, uh, very vulnerable positions who are uh, basically working against uh, sort of authoritarian regimes, uh, what you're doing is creating a method, a reliable method of herd immunity. Uh, even if you aren't trying to protect your own communications, you can protect other people's communications by proxy. You're helping them get lost in the noise. Uh, the, the way to think about this is a lot of people say, you know, particularly in Scandinavian countries, uh, they go, I trust my government. I don't think that they're doing anything wrong, which is actually a little bit uh, generous here. But um, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you do believe that, and that's fair, because governments aren't villains, you know, governments aren't, uh, you know, these, these evil, terrible opponents. Not all uh, of them. They're good people. <laughs> Not all of them. Uh, generally, these are good people trying to do good things. The problem is the culture and intelligence communities and so on and so forth are that good people can do bad things for good reasons, and those bad things are allowable. When the ends justify the means, when we adopt utilitarian methods of operating, uh, these can have deeply corrosive uh, impacts, not just on the operations of our government, but the outcomes of those operations for our society. Uh, and Basically, the thing you want to think about here is it's not about if you're doing anything wrong. It's not about if your government is doing something wrong. We have a fundamental human right to privacy. Um, the monitoring of individuals in advance of any criminal activity is a violation of human rights. Uh, this is not something that's asserted by me. This is something that's asserted by the United Nations uh, and basically any uh, human rights, civil rights, international law lawyer out there. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights affirms this. The International uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights affirms this. Uh, this is the standard of international behavior worldwide. Some politicians want to take the easy way out. They want to justify intrusive programs. Uh, they want to justify pre-criminal investigation into everyone in society, uh, regardless of their role, because they say, well, it will help with terrorism. Now, we have statistics now from people who have very advanced programs, such as the United States, uh, where the intelligence gathering budget is $75 billion a year annually, and they say, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't stop terrorism. It may give, uh, provide you know, intelligence gathering benefit, but even if it does, the argument where people say, you know, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, I don't care if they look at me because I have nothing to hide. That's no different than saying, I don't care about free speech because I have nothing to say. This is a deeply illiberal concept and something that we have an obligation to resist. Thank you. Uh, it, it's something that we have an obligation to push back against. Our rights uh, are protected by governments, but they are not granted by governments. And when governments go too far, the good citizen doesn't stand by and say that's okay. They gently remind their government, and they get more muscular as time goes on and the government gets more wayward, that they need to correct their course, that we need to remember that governments are here to improve the quality of human life, not to undermine it. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Edward Snowden. Thank you so much. Takk for den fine applausen for uh, vår tids uh, store varsler. Uh, Runa, tror du NSA har jobbet på høytrykk de siste uh, 25 minutene for å finne ut hvor han er? Nei, jeg tror ikke. Du tror de vet det allerede? Enten det eller så. Han, han har holdt en god del foredrag i løpet av de siste, de siste to årene. Um, så om de, om de har fått det til eller om de har prøvd, så har de i hvert fall sikkert ja. jobbet en del med det over de siste, siste månedene. Du, um, vi som er her i dag, er vi nå blitt uh, mer interessante for NSA og eventuelt uh, samarbeidet med etterretningsorganisasjoner uh, enn vi var for en time siden? Ja, uh, et, av, et av de dokumentene som, som uh, kom ut uh, fortalte at dersom de har et mål, 
så är er alla som är er to hopp ut fra det målet är er också av intresse för eh, NSA. Så i och med att jag har mött Snowden och det är er här med mig så är er det to hopp under Snowden også. Det er som en slags virtuell könsygdom alltså. Vad säger Okej. Ja. Mm. Jag har lite ikom igår kväll eller någonting. Ja. Vi hör oss nog den om att han menar det är er en slags moralsk förpliktelse i det han har gjort. Um, och det, det menar sig att de flesta här men hur är er det I, I USA hvor du bor i maktens centrum i DC? Ehm um, hur han ses han och hans verksamhet på utanför det journalistiska miljö för det bryr vi oss inte nog särskilt om i den sammanhang. Är er han en helt eller en skurk? Jag vill tro det är er väldigt delt. Du har du har en god del också utanför det journalistiska som där menar helt klart att att han är er en helt. Eh, og så har du då en del som som jobbar enten i NSA eller i, I andra eh, liknande firmaer eh, som helt klart menar att han gick för långt, att han skulle ha brukt andra möjligheter till att sifra att han inte var eh, enig i det som skedde. Någon någon för så vidt gjorde och har förklarat att han prövade på men så har er det också en del folk som som jag tror kanske jag är er intresserad av att ha den diskussionen i det hela tatt. Går det långs en höger vänster också? I vart fall de som de som går offentligt ut och på något har en mening om mm. om, om saken så är er det väldigt delt. Mm. Jag spår det för att det är er ju stolta traditioner i Amerika för att läcka obehagligheter om om krig och och orättfärdighet och jag vet att du som bär med Daniel Ellsberg och folk som som har uh, många av de samma idéerna och hållningarna kan det riktigt? Att jag jobbar med dem? Ja, nej, att det att att det är er en tradition i Amerika för och för att avslöja obehagligheter och uh, förbryta tradition och tradition. Alltså, det bor väldigt, väldigt, väldigt många människor i i USA och uh, det är er så sånt där. Det är er fler, det är er fler varslare en det du kanske har har hört om som då har prövat att bruka interna kanaler och interna möjligheter för att få att sifra om om det som sker. De når inte fram och de ser det att gå ut offentligt i i media som en sista utväg. Men det finns fler varslare än uh, Ellsberg, Snowden och andra som du då kanske har hört om. Mm. Uh, Jag förstår att du blev känd med Snowden på uh, först virtuellt och uh, så på en uh, konferens i Hawaii. Mm-hmm eller på Hawaii, eh, hvor dere har hatt møte bakerst i en eh, snuskete møbelbutikk. Ja, kanskje den ikke var snuskete, men... Det var en møbelbutikk. Ja, en møbelbutikk. Vi har, vi har hatt erfaringer med møbelhandlere her i, I landet også. I tidlige tider. Ingen her husker det lenger. Eh, for, forsto han tidlig effekten av det han var i ferd med å gjøre? Var det ditt inntrykk? Og det først... Uh, nu är er det säkert en del folk som har sett uh, Citizen Four, som är er filmen som uh, Laura Poitras lagde om om de dagarna som som de hade samman. Och som I går på kino här i Hong Kong. Och så allt det. Ja. ja. Uh, och då du ser det är er en del scener där du ser att han sitter och ser på nyheterna. Han sitter och ser på att uh, Glenn Greenwald blir intervjuad och förklarar om de dokumenten som som har kommit ut och att det verkligen är er folk som bryr sig att det är er folk som nå är er sinte som önskar svar och han har tidigare sagt att han var ju väldigt rädd för att han skulle göra detta och gå så pass långt att han varslet med all den information han hade han var väldigt rädd för att det skulle bli ett eller två uppslag och så skulle saken vara död men jag tror att han da han så uh, den mottagelsen som uh, den information fick bara i löp av de första två tre dagarna så tror jag han allerede då følte att som jag 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 har gjort det som är er rätt. Ja och vi har ju hört om se si att uh att hans intellektuella frihet är er begränsat och att vår intellektuella frihet är er begränsat att Obama förrotte folke vilket och sånt så där och så vidare så han han är er en mycket genomtänkt person, ikke sant? Han är er det. Han är er det. Ehm um, är er norsk låt snurras det norska vi vi tar og går ett par minuter över tiden vi lika gott. Vi ser publikum har nog emot det. Är er norska vi så flinke till att 
beskytte sig mot kildelekkasjer. Det siste, siste halvåret så har jeg holdt en del eh, foredrag og en del kurs i Norge, hvor det da har blitt eh, oppslag med Runa Sandvik som sier at mediene gjør det for dårlig. Eh, og det gjentar jeg gjerne i dag. Eh, det, er, det står alt for dårlig til. Det er ikke kryptering mellom mig og norske nettsider, bortsett fra NRK Beta som ligger litt foran alle andre. Det er ikke mulig for mig å sikkert varsle de fleste eh, mediehusene i Norge. Det er også NRK Beta og et par andre som ligger ligge foran der. Eh, og så har det også vært saker der eh, det var et, et av de største mediehusene, kan jeg si, som i en veldig sensitiv sak for et par uker siden blåste eh, sensitive kilder. Og da lurer jeg litt på om det har vært noe sånn eh, diskusjon internt på, på hva, hva som skjedde og hvordan man kan forhindre at dette skjer igjen. Kan, kan du antyde, altså, og da snakker du om at de vilkårlig eller ikke med vilje blåste kildene. Kan du si noe om hvordan de gjorde det for, i god tro? Det var, eh, det var en del anonymiserte bilder som var inkludert i saken, men det var også fullt navn på alle kilder var også inkludert som du så på HTML-koden til den artikkelen. Så kan du se fullt navn, fornavn og etternavn på, på alle de kildene. Så det, det er dette du kaller metadata eh, i bildet? Det var ikke inne i bildet, men det var en del av måte, teksten som du kun kunne se om du gikk inn på eh, den koden bak. Jeg skal ikke spørre mer om hvilket stort mediehus det var, selvfølgelig. Men, eh, men eh, dette har de handlet i god tro. Det håper jeg da. Det håper du. Er norske journalister og norske utgivere for naive på dette området? Altså, jeg, tror jeg, har, jeg har tidligere fått den kommentaren at selvfølgelig vil alle journalister beskytte kildene sine. Det er ingen som, ja, kanskje ingen, forhåpentligvis ingen, som er viten og vilje lekker, blåser kildene sine. Men jeg vil tro at når det kommer til å beskytte kildevernet sånn helt rent teknisk, så er det veldig mange som kanskje ikke helt tenker på hvordan den kommunikasjonen kan bli overvåket. Bare det at jeg går inn på nettsiden din og leser en nytt artikkel, hvis jeg går inn på um, en artikkel og så leser jeg om en streik, så går jeg inn på nettsiden til en advokat som heller ikke er kryptert, og liksom leser om, om arbeidsrett. Så går jeg tilbake til den avisen sin nettside, og så klikker jeg liksom på tips oss og sender en melding. Det at den kommunikasjonen i alle de forskjellige klikkene, og også den meldingen jeg sender er ukryptert, betyr at det er veldig, veldig lett å finne ut at jeg er den som har lest om streiken, jeg er den som har lest om en advokat som kan om arbeidsrett, og jeg er den som da har gått tilbake til den tips oss siden, og så sendt en beskjed. Så bare det å ha en kryptert nettside er noe som er veldig, veldig enkelt å sette opp, og som bør gjøres, og jeg er litt overrasket nå over at det er, dette har jeg snakket om i et halvt år eh, nå, i hvert fall her i, i, i Norge, og det står fortsatt veldig, veldig stille. Det er fremdeles ingen som krypterer. Det er, det er noen få, men så er det, så er det enkelte. Eh, blant annet Aftenposten, som har en varselløsning som er, er usikker, og det har jeg snakket om flere ganger før, mm. og der har det fortsatt ikke skjedd noe. Mm. Ok, så der eh, har vi noe å reise hjem til alle sammen, og eh, jobber med kryptering. Um, du jobber for en organisasjon i USA som heter uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation. Hva gjør du der? Jeg sitter i Technical Advisory Board, mm. eh, og utover det så er jeg... Um, freelance. Jeg jobber med, med journalister, med mediehus, og snakker da blant annet om uh, verktøy som journalistene kan bruke, men også ellers hvordan mediehusene kan, kan gjøre det litt sikrere å lese artikler og ta kontakt med journalister og ha den, den samtalen. Mm. Og, det, og det er det denne Freedom of the Press Foundation har som hovedoppgave? Det er det de har som, som hovedoppgave, men der ligger fokuset mer på journalister i USA, mens jeg jobber gjerne med, med journalister også ellers i, mm. i verden. Hvor mange, eller ja, går det an å kvantifisere hvor mange medier i USA som bruker dere i, i denne sammenhengen, som de tar lærdom og som altså, er interessert det... i å kryptere? Det Freedom of the Press Foundation gjør er at de utvikler et system som heter SecureDrop, Uh, som er en åpen kildekode, gratis å sette opp, som gjør det mulig å varsle journalister kryptert. Da bruker du Tor, det blir helt anonymt at du er den som varsler, og uh, journalistene har da også en sikker måte å laste ned de dokumentene på. Mm. Og nå i løpet av det siste året, så er det, nå er det vel sted mellom 15 og 20 mediehus, for det meste er kanskje 10 i USA, og, men også ellers 
i verden som har satt opp dette systemet. NRK Beta har satt opp og kjørt det en god stund allerede. Og nå virker det som om, i hvert fall i USA, så virker det litt som jeg har litt sånn følelsen av at du er ikke et, du tar ikke kildevern seriøst nok dersom du ikke har dette systemet. Du har snakket om det, og så må vi snakke litt om Tor. Hva er Tor? Tor er et gratis program som gjør det mulig å være anonym når du surfer på internett. Så det vil si at hvis jeg besøker en nettside, så kan arbeidsgiveren min, de som er på samme trådesnett som meg, ISP-en min, politiet, kan kun si at jeg bruker Tor. På andre siden så kan den avisen kun si at her er det noen som bruker Tor til å besøke denne siden. Du får ikke vite at det er jeg som bruker Tor til å besøke den siden. Er dette også et medel for å for eksempel logge på Facebook hvis man lever en periode av sitt liv i en totalitær stat? Og kommer rundt murer og slike ting? Tor kan også brukes ikke bare til å nå hvilken som helst nettside anonymt, men du kan også komme rundt den brandmuren, så blant annet i Syria, i Iran, i Kina, og så i England for eksempel. Om du skal besøke The Pirate Bay, så kommer du ikke gjennom i England, og da kan du bruke Tor til å nå de sidene uansett. Hvorfor heter den Tor? Det pleide å stå for The Onion Router, som er en forklaring på måten Tor krypterer informasjonen fra meg og til nettsiden det besøkes. For den krypteres i tre lag, for du sender trafikken din gjennom tre forskjellige servere et eller annet sted i verden. Og på hver server så stopper den datapakken opp, og så blir det tatt av et lag med kryptering, selv som du skreller en løk. Ok. Og så er det et annet apparat som heter Secure Drop. Hva er det? Det må du også fortelle oss før tiden er gått. Secure var det at dette er også åpen kildekode, som da er et system, så du setter opp en nettside som du kun kan besøke over Tor, som gjør det helt sikkert og anonymt å sende og sende beskjeder. Og da er det mediehus som har satt opp dette, som gjør at det er lett for kilder og anonymt og sikkert varsle. Sånn at en avis eller et mediehus kan annonsere nærmest at vi har Secure Drop, så du tips og trykt hos oss. Ja, NRK Beta har gjort dette. NRK Beta har også skrevet en veldig god artikkel om akkurat hvorfor de valgte å sette opp dette systemet, og hvordan de bruker det. Ok. Da, dere, må vi runde av. Da vet alle redaktører og disponenter i salen hva de skal reise hjem og kjøpe og installere i redaksjonen sine. Vi skal takke for her. Takk til Runa Sandvik. Takk. Oh, God.